Chapter 2, Section 1. What are the implications of defining liberty in terms of property rights? The change from defending liberty to defending property rights has important implications. For one thing, it allows right libertarians to imply that private property is similar to a fact of nature, and so to conclude that the restrictions on freedom produced by it can then be ignored. This can be seen in Robert Nozick's argument that decisions are voluntary if the limitations on one's actions are not caused by human action, which infringe the rights of others. Thus, in a pure capitalist society, the restrictions on freedom caused by wage slavery are not really restrictions because the worker voluntarily, uh, voluntarily consents to the contract. The circumstances that drive a worker to make the contract are irrelevant because they're created by people exercising their rights and not violating others, other people's ones. See the section on voluntary exchange in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, uh, and Utopia pages 262 to 265, for reference on this. This means that within a society, whether a person's actions are voluntary depends on what limits his alternatives. In fact, in fa uh, if facts of nature do so, the actions are voluntary. I may voluntarily walk to some place I would prefer to fly to unaided. Similarly, the results of voluntary actions and the transference of property can be considered alongside the facts of nature. They are, after all, the resultants of natural rights. This means that the circumstances created by the existence and use of property can be considered, in essence, as a natural fact, and so the actions we take in response to these circumstances are therefore voluntary and we are free. Nozick presents the example in two six, page 263 of someone who marries the only available person. All of the more attractive people are having already chosen others is a case of an action that is voluntary despite removal of all but the least attractive alternative through the legitimate actions of others. Needless to say, the example can be and is extended to workers on the labor market, although, of course, you do not starve to death if you don't decide to get married. However, such an argument fails to notice that property is different from, oh, I don't know, let's say gravity or biology. Of course, not being able to fly does not restrict freedom. Neither does not being able to jump 10 feet into the air. But unlike gravity, for example, private property has to be protected by laws and the police. No one stops you from flying, but laws and police force must exist to ensure that capitalist property and the owner's authority over it is respected. The claim, therefore, that private property in general, and capitalism in particular, can be considered as facts of nature, like gravity, ignores an important fact, namely that the people involved in an economy must accept the rules of its operation, rules that, for example, allow contracts to be enforced, forbid using another's property without their consent, theft, trespass, copyright infringement, etc., prohibit conspiracy, unlawful assembly, rioting, and so on, and create monopolies through regulation, licensing, charters, patents. This means that capitalism has to include the mechanisms for deterring property crimes as well as mechanisms for compensation and punishment should such crimes be committed. In other words, capitalism is in fact far more, uh, far more than voluntary bilateral exchange because it must include the policing, arbitration, arbitration, and legislating mechanisms required to ensure its operation. Hence, like the state, the capitalist market is a social institution, and the distribution of goods that results from its operation are therefore the distribution sanctioned by the capitalist society. As Benjamin Franklin even pointed out, private property is a creation of society and is subject to the calls of that society. Thus, to claim what Sir Isaiah Berlin, the main modern source of the concepts of negative and positive freedom, although we must add that Berlin was not a right libertarian, that if my property were a, a kind of disease which prevented me from buying bread, as lameness prevents me from running, this inability would not naturally be described as a lack of freedom totally misses the point. Two concepts of freedom in four essays on liberty, page 123. If you are disabled, police officers don't come around to stop you running. They don't have to. However, they are required to protect the property against the dispossessed and those who reject those capitalist property rights. 
This means that by using such concepts as negative liberty and ignoring the social nature of private property, right libertarians are trying to turn the discussion away from liberty towards biology and other facts of nature. And conveniently, by placing property rights alongside the likes of gravity and other natural laws, they also succeed in reducing debate even about rights. Of course, Coercion and restriction of liberty can be resi uh, resisted, unlike natural forces like gravity. So if, as Berlin argues, negative freedom means that you lack political freedom only if you are prevented from attaining, it, uh, attaining a goal by human beings, then capitalism is indeed based on such a lack, since property rights need to be enforced by human beings. I am prevented by others from doing what I could otherwise do. After all, as Proudhon long ago noted, the market is man-made, hence any constraint it imposes is the coercion of man by man, and so economic laws are not as inevitable as natural ones. You can see more on this uh, from Alan Ritter's uh, analysis of Proudhon through the political thought of Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, page 122. Or, to put it slightly differently, capitalism requires coercion in order to work, and hence is not similar to a fact of nature, regardless of Nozick's claims, i.e. property rights have to be defined and enforced by human beings, although the nature of the labor market resulting from capitalist uh, property definitions is such that direct coercion is usually not needed. This implication is actually recognized by right libertarians because they argue that the rights framework of a society should be set up in one way rather than another. In other words, they recognize that society is not independent of human interaction and so can be changed. Perhaps, as seems the case, the so-called anarcho-capitalist or the right libertarian will claim that, it's, that it is only deliberate acts which violate your libertarian-defined rights by other human beings that cause unfreedom. We define freedom as the absence of invasion by another man of a, uh, of, an, uh, of a man's property or person, Rothbard in The Ethics of Liberty, page 41. And so if no one deliberately coerces you, then you're free. In this way, the workings of the capitalist market can be placed alongside the facts of nature then and ignored as a source of unfreedom. However, a moment's thought shows that this is not the case. Both deliberate and non-deliberate acts can leave individuals lacking freedom. Let us assume, in an example paraphrased from Alan Hayworth's uh, excellent book, Anti-Libertarianism, page 49, that someone kidnaps you and places you down a deep, naturally formed pit, miles from anywhere, which is impossible to climb up. No one would deny that you are unfree. Let us further assume that another person walks by and accidentally falls into the pit with you. According to right libertarianism, while you are unfree, subject to deliberate coercion, your fellow pit dweller is perfectly free, for they have the subject. They uh, they are subject to the facts of nature and not human action, deliberate or otherwise. Or perhaps they voluntarily chose to stay in the pit. After all, it is only the facts of nature limiting their actions. Obviously, both of you are in exactly the same position, have exactly the same choices, and so are equally unfree. Thus, a definition of liberty that maintains that only deliberate acts of others, for example, coercion, reduces freedom, misses the point entirely. So why is this example important? Well, let's consider Murray Rothbard's analysis of the situation after the abolition of serfdom in Russia and slavery in America. The bodies of the oppressed were freed, but the property which they had worked and eminently deserved to own remained in the hands of their former oppressors. With economic power thus remaining in their hands, the former lords soon found themselves virtual masters, once more of what, they were, na oh, what were now free tenants or farm laborers. The serfs and slaves had tasted freedom, but had been cruelly derived of its fruits. Ethics of Liberty, page 74. However, Contrast this with Rothbard's claims that if market forces, so-called voluntary exchanges, result in the creation of free tenants or laborers, then these laborers and tenants are free. You can see this, on, uh, for example, in The Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard, pages 221 to 222, on why economic power within capitalism does not exist. But 
the laborers dispossessed by market forces are in exactly the same situation as the former serfs and slaves. Rothbard sees the obvious economic power in the latter case, but denies it in the former. But the conditions of the people in question are identical, and it is these conditions that horrify the likes of actual anarchists. It's, it's only his ideology that stops Rothbard drawing the obvious conclusion. Identical conditions produce identical social relationships, and so if the formerly free ex-serfs are subject to economic power and masters, then so are the formerly free laborers within capitalism. Both sets of workers may be formerly free, but their circumstances are such that they are free to consent to sell their freedom to others, i.e. economic power produces relationships of domination and unfreedom between formerly free individuals. Thus, Rothbard's definition of liberty in terms of rights fails to provide us with a realistic and viable understanding of freedom. Someone can be a virtual slave while still having their rights non-violated. Conversely, someone can have their property rights violated and still be free. For example, a child who enters your backyard without your permission to get their ball hardly violates your liberty. Indeed, you would never know that they had even entered your property unless you happened to see them do it. So, the idea that freedom means non-aggression against a person and their legitimate material property justifies extension, extensive non-freedom for the working class. The non-violation of property rights does not imply freedom, as Rothbard's discussion of the former slaves shows. Anyone who, along with Rothbard, defines freedom as the absence of invasion by another person of any person's person or property is, a deeply, is in a deeply inequality society, is supporting and justifying capitalist and landlord domination. As anarchists have long realized, in an unequal society, a contractarian starting point implies absolutist conclusion. Why is this? Simply because freedom is the result of a social interaction, not the product of some isolated abstract individual. Rothbard uses the model of Robinson Crusoe to, to construct his ideology, literally. But as Bakunin argued, the freedom of the individual is a function of men in society, a, ne uh, a necessary consequence of the collective development of mankind. He then goes on to argue that man in isolation can have no awareness of his liberty. Liberty is therefore a feature not of isolation but of interaction, not of exclusion but rather of connection. Right libertarians, by building their definition of freedom from the isolated person, ended up by, uh, end up by supporting restrictions of liberty due to a neglect of an adequate recognition of the actual interdependence of human beings, of the fact that what each person does is affected and affects others. People become aware of their humanity and their liberty in society, not outside of it. It's, it is the very social relationships we take part in which determine how free we are, and any definition of freedom which builds upon an individual without social ties is doomed to create relations of domination, not freedom, between individuals at least, as Rothbard's theory does. To put it another way, voluntary association is a necessary but not sufficient condition for freedom, which is why anarchists have always stressed the importance of equality. So... While facts of nature can restrict your, your options and freedom, it's the circumstances within which they act and the options they limit that are important. A person trapped at the bottom of a pit is unfree as the options available are so few. The disabled person is free because their available options are extensive. In the same manner, the facts of society can and do restrict freedom, because they are the products of human action and are defined and protected by human institutions. It's the circumstances within which each individual make their decisions and the social relationships um, these decisions produce that are important. The worker driven by poverty to accept a slave contract in a sweatshop is unfree because the circumstances they face have limited their options and the relations they accept are based upon hierarchy. The person who decides to join an anarchist commune is free because the commune is non-hierarchical and they have the option of joining another commune, working alone, and so forth. 
all in all, the right libertarian concept of freedom is, to say the very least, lacking. For an ideology that takes the name libertarianism, it seems happy to ignore actual liberty and instead concentrate on an abstract form of liberty, which ignores so many sources of unfreedom as to narrow the concept until it becomes little more than a justification for authoritarianism. This can be seen from the right libertarian attitudes about private property and its effects on liberty.